Okay, welcome to Form 3411 Artificial Intelligence. Uh, my name is Alan Blair, I'm the lecturer in charge for this course, and uh, we're going to be using WebCMS uh, for this course, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, and so all the lecture notes and tutorials and so on will be up on this website. One slightly unusual thing about this course, so in, in a lot of courses, tutorials don't begin until week two. In this course, tutorials will begin this week. Okay, so this Wednesday and Thursday, and if you have a look at iTunes, I don't want iTunes. If you have a look at the tutorial questions for this week, it's really just uh, a couple of things. First of all, a bit of a philosophical discussion uh, about what is artificial intelligence and so on. And then, secondly, uh, at the beginning of next week's tutorial, uh, everyone is going to give a brief presentation about some particular area of AI and comment on to what extent it's been achieved and uh, what challenges remain and so on. So there's about uh, nine or ten different topics here. So during the tutorial, um, we'll be assigning, I'll be assigning two people for each, for each of these tasks. Uh, and then you'll get up and give a brief presentation at the beginning of the tutorial in week two. Very brief, just one or two, two minutes. So just do a bit of a web search and see uh, what's going on. So you might want to have a think about this. These are going to be the lecture times, Monday 10 o'clock to 12, and Thursday 10 to 11 in CLV 5. Uh, the textbook for this course is uh, Artificial Intelligence and Modern Approach by Russell and Norvig. This is a very uh, good textbook. It's used in a lot of courses around the world. It's very thick, covers a lot of topics, um, with more topics than we could possibly cover in one session, but it's good to have it as a reference book in the future. Um, this is actually the old edition that I've got here, the 2003. It's been, if you can get the third edition from 2009, that's, that's the best one. It's got more updated references and so on, but if you happen to have uh, this second edition floating around uh, from somewhere, um, you can probably manage with that. Does anyone have the third edition, by the way? Anyone can, hold, can you hold it up and show us what it looks like? <laughs> Not here. Okay, it's available down in the, um, in the bookshop. Now, there's various other books I'll be mentioning throughout the course that you might want to have a look at as references. Uh, one of them is this book here by Nils Nilsson, Artificial Intelligence and New Synthesis. Uh, we kind of like uh, we kind of like the organisation of this book in terms of the order in which the topics are presented. So the order we'll be following that other textbook pretty closely, but we may deviate a little bit in terms of the order uh, of the chapters and that sort of thing. And um, some other books I'll be mentioning along the way. This one here is um, Vehicles, Experiments in Synthetic Psychology by Valentino Breitenberg. I'll be talking more about this when we get to reactive agents. So the assessment for this course, uh, there's going to be two or three assignments during the course that will add up to a total of 40%. And uh, the written exam will be the other 60%. Um, I'll say a little bit more about the assignments as we go along. Last, we've sort of changed, uh, we've, we've experimented with various different topics for the assignments over the years. Last year we had a pretty heavy emphasis on robotics. This year we're going to try uh, to move away from that probably. We might have a small, uh, a small assignment on robotics but probably not the major uh, assignment. Um, but here's some examples of what kind of things we might ask in the assignments. Enable an agent to act in a simulated environment. Solve a problem using search techniques. Play a game. Apply a machine learning algorithm. Or enable the communication or cooperation between agents, that sort of thing. To pass the course, of course, you need to get 50 
uh, percent overall. There's also uh, hurdle requirements for the assignments in the exam, but you only need to get at least 40% for the assignments and at least 40% for the exam. So as long as you make a reasonable attempt at the assignments, you ought to be able to get this 16 out of, uh, out of 40. Uh, you're big, big boys and girls in third year now, you know all about plagiarism, you know that it's taken quite seriously in our school, and so uh, by all means discuss uh, the assignments with your friends and uh, your approaches and so on, but uh, under no circumstances uh, email any code uh, to your friends or um, if someone asks you to email them your code, just uh, tell them no. Yeah. And there's more information here. These are the topics that we plan to cover. Uh, the first few topics actually go through the first few chapters in the textbook quite closely. Environment types, agent types, search techniques, and game playing. Uh, we assume all of, almost all of you have done the course 2911, um, or a couple of you, I think, I've been given permission to do it as a co-requisite instead of a prereq, but you know, which means you're doing it right now. So uh, I'll be assuming uh, the search techniques that you're learning in that course, you know, depth first search, breadth first search, and so on. Um, actually, just out of interest, who, who's done, who did 2911 last session? Who did it the session before? Okay, um, now what did you, did you do any um, game search in that course or, or any other course? You did, did you do alpha, beta, pruning for example? Yes. <laughs> yes, you did, okay. All right, so, um, so who, who, who has seen uh, alpha, beta, pruning in grain tree search? Put your hands up. Okay, quite a few of you. Okay, but not all of you, right? So I'll try to, um, tailor this material accordingly and try to, so that it's, uh, so that we quickly review some of those topics but don't, uh, you know, we can assume a uh, fair bit of background. And then logical inference, machine learning, we're going to do decision trees as well, I didn't uh, have space to put all the smaller topics. And then at the, in the latter part of the course we might have guest lecturers come in to give uh, talks about robotics and other topics. So uh, Michael Tischler is probably going to come in and talk about general game playing. Uh, Claude Salmon will talk about robotics and um, we may have some other, a couple of other guest lectures as well. After you finish this course, if you're interested in further uh, examining this material, uh, there's a course called Robotic Software Architecture that runs next session. I think it's limited to about 20 undergraduate students, so I'm not, not sure if um, it might, the danger it might fill up. There's also an experimental robotics course, uh, machine learning and data mining, which is usually in first session, so you might think about doing it next year. This neural networks course, we're not sure if it's going to run this year or not. Um, if you're more interested in the logic side, there's KRR. Uh, I think the machine lit vision course will run next session, and there's also Malcolm Ryan's game design workshop, or you may think about doing an AI topic for your fourth year thesis. <coughs> Any questions so far? Now, AI really has a long history. The interesting thing about AI, it's, it's uh, very much a multidisciplinary endeavor and uh, every, you know, people, philosophers, mathematicians, psychologists, linguists, all sorts of different people have had a look at this and had a go at it and they all come with their own particular um, views. So the first people really to look at it were the philosophers starting in classical Greece and just briefly to try to go give you an idea of how many different topics uh, there are here. Uh, the philosophers have the idea of what is, you know, what is the mind? Well, the mind is like a, 
a machine, you know, they're likened it to those mechanical clocks and astro, uh, astronomical, astronomical predictors and so on that they had at the time, and they said, okay, well, maybe it operates uh, with knowledge encoded in some sort of internal language, and we can use logical reasoning to try to decide what are the right actions to take. And they also were interested in the question of what is consciousness, which, of course, people are still arguing about today. Perhaps in the Middle Ages or uh, the early modern period, mathematicians start getting involved in this, and uh, physicists and statisticians and logicians and so on. So they think about this, well, they've developed various tools to try to, uh, to, to capture the essence of, of what it is to think and be intelligent. So tools for manipulating logical statements, whether things are true or false, tools to manipulate probabilistic statements, what's the likelihood of a certain thing happening, or my likelihood of being in a particular place, or an object being in a particular place. Um, algorithms, computational algorithms and their analysis, including complexity. Um, so there's sort of this logical, uh, a Boolean algebra kind of approach, and then uh, separate to that there's this kind of dynamical systems approach, uh, recurrent neural networks, uh, models based on statistical physics, um, pattern recognition, and differential equations and statistics and uh, all that kind of uh, good stuff. Then you have the field of psychology, which began uh, around about the turn of the 19th, 20th century with, uh, with Sigmund Freud and later on cognitive science. So again, this idea of humans as information processing machines, the idea of introspection, trying to think about your own thoughts and dreams and, and the subconscious and the interpretation of that. Um, experiments with human subjects to try to figure out things about how the brain works. Uh, there's the whole question, apart from artificial intelligence, there's a question of what is human intelligence, how do we measure intelligence, um, you know, the, the, the so-called IQ test was really developed, I think, in France in the late 19th century. They were just looking for a quick and easy way, when they nationalized the school system, they were looking for a quick and easy way to assign children to different classes and so on. And you can have a look at uh, websites like this to have a look at some um, modern thinking about IQ tests and also learning and memory. A lot of these cognitive science tasks are to do with memory. <laughs> I should have asked, there, is anyone here studying some philosophy? Yes? <laughs> You're studying philosophy? Yeah. Oh, soft train for the last 15. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, uh, well, I'm uh, 20, 10, 29 cents, so I'm a bit, bit older than that. Right, right. Uh, I'm just purely here for self-interest. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah. Any mathematicians here? Or psychologists? No. Anyone did first year psychology or any other stuff? Yeah, so did you have to do experiments where people memorize things or um, something? Or? Nearly every lecture, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Some pattern, like you see a word and you have to remember the related mm. words. And they manipulate what we remembered and things like that. Uh -huh. Did you uh, experiment with rats as, as well? Uh, we watched the experiments with rats. Sorry? We watched experiments with you rats. You watched experiments, yeah. yeah. They're very cool. Um, and then there's linguistics, which really began in uh, around 1950. So the study of language itself fits into this idea of, of uh, the mind as an information processing machine. Uh, Noam Chomsky came up with this hierarchy of different l complexity classes of, of language and there's been a lot of work on natural language processing which is sort of intimately connected with AI. And uh, anyone studying linguistics here? Yes, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, first year, second year? Second. Second year, 
Um, so computer engineering, building robots. Uh, well, yeah, so uh, mechanical tasks, building robots that can run and jump. Also making computers faster. So some, some unkind people have suggested that the only the only advances in AI in the last 20 years have been because computers got faster. I think mean, maybe that's a little bit harsh, but it probably is part of the uh, part of the story. And then there's what we sometimes call biocybernetics or neurobiology. So people look studying the brain at a very low level, looking at individual cells and how they operate. Uh, looking at groups of cells in small organisms like the nematode worm um, and so on, uh, molecular level ion channels within the brain and that kind of thing. And then there are people who also study the brain. These two words are obviously very similar, neurobiology and neurology. These people also study the brain but they study it at a sort of higher level of organization. So giving people drugs and observing the effects that it has on their behavior, um, looking at people with various brain disorders and, and uh, trying to understand how the brain works by what, what goes wrong when certain things uh, break, and brain scans, you know, PET scans, MRI scans, and so on, which areas of the brain are active during certain kinds of tasks. So, you know, the summary is that it's very much a multidisciplinary uh, endeavor and uh, continues to be to this, to this day. <coughs> now if we go back to, if we look at theories of artificial intelligence over the, over the centuries, uh, those philosophers we mentioned from ancient Greece kind of divided into two different schools of thought and that was the case for several hundred years afterwards rationalism and empiricism now this is where the philosophers might have a bit more light on this I mean, I, I'm not really a philosopher but I think basically empiricism is, where, is the idea that our knowledge comes from our direct experience yeah. of the world whereas rationalism says that a lot of our knowledge doesn't come from experience, that it's actually, we're either born with it uh, or from the knowledge that we're born with, we then um, you know, can sit around and think and, and, and deduce new facts from the facts that we, we knew before. Is that, is that a reasonable cartoon uh, yeah. of the situation? And these debates went on, as I said, up until probably the 1780s when Immanuel Kant wrote his critique of pure reason and he kind of argued that there can be a synthesis of these two views. Yeah, is that... Uh, Immanuel Descartes. 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 That was a big break there uh, for, in relation to uh, re relevance for science. Yes, uh -huh. Descartes. And, and also Kant as well. Now, I think the... Perhaps the last word on this rationalism and empiricism debate goes to a very popular T-shirt. Um, <laughs> Nietzsche is saying to be, is to be, is to be, Kant is saying to be, is to do, and Frank Sinatra is saying to be, to be. <laughs> so I mentioned psychology. Uh, so 1899 is the year when Sigmund Freud published his most influential work, which was a book called The Interpretation of Dreams. Freud, uh, he's a bit of a controversial figure today. Many of his theories are not really believed in detail anymore. But I think the essence of what he was saying was that, that there's a subconscious mind and underneath the con what we're consciously aware of, there's this whole kind of subconscious mind. And what we're seeing in the conscious mind is really just kind of the tip of this very big iceberg, and that, you know, that was a huge step forward, which is still um, very much accepted today. And um, this theory of behaviorism, the stimulus-response kind of experiments, uh, Skinner was conducting experiments in the US in the 1950s, and also the Russian 
uh, Pavlov was doing experiments like this with his dogs in, in, uh, in the Soviet Union until I think he's, I heard recently his dogs got eaten during the siege of St. Petersburg, uh, or, which is a shame. But anyway, um, so behaviorism again, uh, there's been ongoing debates with this. Chomsky argued against behaviorism and, and showed that language uh, has to, that, that language is more complicated than what can be explained by just stimulus and response. But uh, today, sort of behaviorism has made a little bit of a resurgence that people have shown that with statistical, you, you can actually extract a lot of information from statistical analysis of um, language, uh, body, corpuses of language and so on. I believe it's also instructive to look at artificial intelligence in literature and uh, the interesting thing about this is at least in the Western tradition or the European tradition, uh, creating life is always seen as something sort of dark. There's, a, there's this kind of dark undertones to this that if you try to, that, that uh, it's sort of tied up with religion in a way, that uh, creating life is what God does, what the gods, whether it's one <coughs> god or multiple gods, that's what the gods do. And if we, uh, if we as humans try to create life, it's, the, it's, it's great hubris. We're, take, we're trying to elevate ourselves to the level of gods and, and take over the role that is played by God or gods and, and bad things are going to result. So if you go back to Greek mythology, uh, Pygmalion was an artist who created a sculpture and the sculpture came to life. And somehow he just became obsessed with the sculpture, with the sculpture, and spent all of his time in the studio hanging out with the sculpture, and never, never came out and saw his friends again, and so on. Um, Icarus. Who, does anyone know who Icarus was? Yes, it was Icarus. Yeah, he flew too close to the sun. That's right. Exactly. Uh, he wanted to fly, and Daedalus. Um, made a set of wings for him and but he flew too close to the sun and the wax melted and his wings fell off and he died right so again it's this idea of technology being bad and um trying to fly is like trying to get too close to gods in some sense and we can go um down through history so frankenstein the same kind of thing frankenstein made a monster, well he made a, a creature by sewing together bits of dead bodies and he animated it with lightning, electricity from lightning and somehow the creature became bad and killed his wife and did all sorts of that. It killed him eventually in the end. And so on and then we got um, Robert's universe, uh, Rossum's universal robot. So, so what was your name? Uh, Mark. Uh, right. Yeah. The, the word robot. Yeah. Is a Czech word. Yeah. Yeah. So this was uh, a play written by a Czech author. Yeah. Allegedly, this is the first time the word robot ever appeared. And again, there's some dark side to this. You know, the robots take over all the jobs, and um, you know, the society collapses or something like that. Now, interestingly, though, this is the Western tradition. If you go over to Japan, you actually see a bit of a different uh, attitude. And um, they, surveys have been done um, in Japan compared to Europe and the United States. You know, asking first of all, how do you feel about robots? Are robots good? Are they bad? And secondly, name some robots, right? And in the Western tradition, people automatically name the Terminator, um, you know, Frankenstein, or whatever, you know, like bad, evil robots doing bad things. And robots are bad, it's just bad, 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 bad. In Japan, people are like, oh, robots are nice, robots are our friends, and they're here to help us, and they always, you know. <laughs> 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 Uh, uh, Astro Ball, I think 
or the, sometimes it's translated as the mighty atom or whatever, you know, astroboid. This was written by Samu Tezuka in the 1950s. And uh, they might also mention, I think, I'm not an expert, I think this is Zundam, but he's also a robot who's nice, who's here to help us, and so, you know, we should be trying to promote a positive image of robotics, and even Pinocchio, I've got my own little, uh, I've got my own little Pinocchio here. Okay. And again, it's all t it's tied up with other cultural influences. It's interesting that there's, um, um, it's related to other beliefs as well. Like in Western, in Europe, until the 19th century, there was a belief that we ought not to climb to the top of very high mountains. Um, and again, it was because that, that was the domain of the gods. And if we go up there, we're invading their territory and something bad is going to happen. Whereas in Japan, they never had that attitude. Climbing Mount Fuji was always seen as something, a good thing to do, you know, a, pil a kind of pilgrimage. At least to do it once. I think there's a saying in Japan that if you if you climb Mount Fuji once, you are wise. If you climb it twice, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's that's the literature. Um, and again, today's literature sometimes becomes tomorrow's reality, although not always. Okay, so um, I'm only in. I'm going to on Thursday. I'll talk uh, more. I'll give more of a uh, the modern history of artificial intelligence from '56 to the present. But for the moment, I just want to look at the kind of prehistory. So in the 1600s, Blaise Pascal and and Gottfried Leibniz were in got interested in this idea of a mechanical adding machine or a ca mechanical calculator and I think it was Leibniz, he had this idea that all all disputes could eventually be resolved by calculation, <laughs> you know, this idea if two people were in dispute with each other about whether they should do this or that um, instead of fighting they would just, one of them would say to the other calculemus, you know, let us let us calculate this, you know, and they'd sit down and with one of these uh, mechanical devices and figure out um, the results, you know, the implications <laughs> of the thing, and then they both, once they saw it, they both agree. You know? Now, when you look at the debates that have raised in recent years over the GST or other uh, political issues, maybe this was a naive view of the world, but there's something nice, that it's nice, it would be nice to think that the world did actually work that way. Um, Wolfgang von Kempelen made this um, magic trick, this chess playing machine, we'll talk about that later. Um, Charles Babbage and Ada, Ada Lovelace, uh, they actually went f so far as to design a difference engine and they never were able to raise enough money to build it in their own time, but in 1990 a group actually went back to their original plans and were able to build their different engine using technology, prove that if they, if they essentially proved that if, if these guys had had the money, they would have been able to build it in the 19th century with the technology of the day. And their difference engine that was built is on display in London at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, then you've got logic. Okay, George Bull obviously invented Boolean logic or Boolean algebra, and then you've got um, predicate logic. It's the Turing test we'll talk about in a minute, and then in 1956 was the first actual artificial intelligence conference. Okay. Now at this point, I'd like to open the discussion to you guys and <laughs> put it to you uh, to tell me what, what is intelligence. Let me see if I can get this. Uh, let me see if I can get this document camera working. 